The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, are there any of those forms still out there? All right, now that we've done the really exciting part, let's, let, let, let's, try, uh, let's try saying something about what this what this course is about um, and why you bothered to try to get yourself lotteried in. Many, many, whoop, many, many, any other forms? Last chance? Many, 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 many uh, MIT courses are of the form. You know, when you go to, go to the first class, you get the syllabus, you look at the list of topics, you say, I don't know anything about these topics, but I sure hope that by the end of the course I know something about these topics. An intro psych class is different from that, because if you take a look at the list of, uh, of, of topics in the course, which you can find, by the way, on the back page of the syllabus, but you don't need to go looking for it right now, you will discover, you know, memory, learning, cognition, emotion, um, a, a, a personality, intelligence, a whole set of topics that you already have some notion about. They're terms that you use in, in, in everyday speech um, that you can converse about perfectly happily. The job of this course is to dig behind um, the, uh, what, what you would know in what's known as folk psychology. Folk psychology is a, uh, a, a, a term coined in the 19th century to refer to the psychology that folk know, as opposed to the psychology that one would learn in the, in the academy like you are here. It, what we used to say, actually when, it, when, it, when the term was defined for me in graduate school, I think somebody said, um, folk psychology, that's the psychology that your grandmother knows. That doesn't work so well because your grandmother may well have a PhD in psychology these days. Folk psychology is what the psychology that you would know without bothering to take a course like that. This, like the, the psychology you just pick up on the street. Um, this course is designed to go beyond, go beyond that. Well, yeah, let, let me, let me, let me uh, dig up an example. Let me close the door. And um, so let, let's, as a... Um, uh, as, as an example, I could assert, oh, let's see, I, 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 need, uh, I, I need a person. Well, that's, this, is, this is why one sits in the front row. You're a person. That's very good. What's your name? Hi, I'm Mark. You're Mark. Okay. Who is that woman sitting next to you? Laura. This is Laura. Okay. I could say that Mark loves Laura. It may or may not be true. For all I know, Mark, is, it is true. This is... <laughs> This is, uh, um, well, this is, this is going to be a more interesting example than sometimes. Um, but, all right, if I assert that, um, that, that Mark loves Laura, without much knowledge of either Mark or Laura here, you have, that's, it's not a sentence that's, a, that, that's, a, a, that, that's hard for you to understand. Um, but what is it that we're, we're actually talking about? Um, so, what, you know, what, 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 all right, what's love? Um, I think, I didn't check, I was going to check this morning, but I, I, I didn't check. I think that the, probably the, the, the line you would get in, in, uh, um, in a dictionary would assert that love is an emotion, and then it would go on to describe what kind of an emotion is. But it's, a, it's an odd emotion, um, if it is an emotion. Um, if you think about other emotions that are pretty straightforward, let's say sadness or happiness, um, to give two straightforward examples, you know what sadness and happiness feel like. They have a distinctive feeling to them. Um, there is a distinctive feeling to being in love. There's no doubt that, that, that there's a feeling aspect. It's actually an interesting question why we use the same word feeling to talk about feeling in love and feeling the table. What, what is it? What, what's, the, what's the commonality there? But the feeling of being in love is not, in the is not simple in the same way that the feeling of sadness or the feeling of happiness is. For instance, you can be sad or happy in love, right? That you, 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 can, you can be in love 
and the experience of that could be either sad or happy. The experience of being sad cannot be either sad or happy. Sad is sad. It's in, a, in some sense an atomic um, sensation in a way that, that, uh, that love does not appear to be. Um, you can wake up in the morning feeling sad disembodied sort of sadness or disembodied sort of happiness. You can't really, it's hard to imagine what it would be to wake up and say, I feel love. It's not clear that that makes, and there's sort of a quasi-religious sense that you could get to it. You know, I feel love for the whole universe or something like that. That's lovely, but um, <laughs> you, see, you see the distinction. So maybe it's not an emotion in the simple sense that sadness or happiness is. Um, Maybe it's a way of thinking about your current state. You know, I feel happy and my heart is pounding and I'm sitting next to, oh God, I've forgotten her name already, uh, Laura. 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 No, you. L-A-R-A, Laura. And Mark. They both have two, they have two letters in common. That's the basis for this relationship. <laughs> the, um, anyway. You know, so, you know, where was I? Um, the, uh, you're not going to wake up feeling a disembodied sense of love. Maybe you're thinking, maybe what it is is a thought about the state that you are currently in. So maybe it's a cognition rather than an, um, an emotion. But if it's a cognition, it's a different kind of cognition from what you might think of as a sort of an atomic cognition. Um, because it has this aspect of feeling to it. Um, that, uh, that other cognitions don't, like, um, what's the capital, capital of Equatorial Guinea? I have no idea, but it's a thought that, I, mean, I, I can think about that fact. It doesn't carry with it any deep feeling unless it turns out to be a question on the final exam. Um, the, um, but you can have thoughts that aren't, aren't colored in this emotional kind of a way. So it's not a simple cognition. Um, it might be more useful to call it a motivation than to call it a, um, a, an emotion. Motivations are like emotions in the sense of having this affective, affect is the sort of jargony term for, for feeling, um, this affective component to it. Um, but the sorts of things that get talked about as motivations are things like thirst. So, it being warm, I'm thirsty. That's a faintly unpleasant state, and I, a motivation is something that motivates me to do something to change, uh, to change my state. And, you know, hunger, another, another good example. <coughs> so what is, what kind of motivation would love be? Love might be a motivation that um, it's directed to an object of some sort, and it, it's, <coughs> I knew I shouldn't have caught that cold from that third grader in my house. <clears throat> That's better. Um, it's a motivation that, uh, if love is a motivation, what, what it's motivating you to do is to perhaps get closer um, to, uh, to possess the object of desire. Now, Mark and Laura are busy sitting there saying, oh boy, that doesn't sound so good. But love, of course, can be used not just in the Mark and Laura sense, but, you know, you can love your laptop <clears throat> or something like that and, and, you know, have... We won't go there, Mark. It's okay. Um, but, but that does lead you, to, th th those are two clearly sort of different senses of, of, of love, uh, and, and, or at least your, your, your chortling suggests that you think of them in, in different senses. You might ask what love is for. Uh, the motiv if, thirst is a, if thirst is a motivation, it's because you need liquid in order to be alive, <clears throat> right? And you don't drink stuff, you're going to be dead. Um, what's love for? Well, the, the, the usual answers to that these days in psychology would come out of the chunk of psychology that's called evolutionary psychology that sees these core motivations, if you like, as things that evolved over the um, history of the species and of, of life in general to serve um, useful purposes for the organism. In this case, um, 
love is presumably in service of that great evolutionary good, which is to get your genes into the next generation. That the goal, of, that, that your goal, if you're a thoroughgoing evolutionary psychologist, your goal in life basically is to get genes into the next um, generation, to perpetuate your genes. And you know, the, 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 the sex and reproduction thing is a good way to do that. It's not the only way to do that, it's important to note. How many of you are only children? Well, no, actually, let's go the other way. How many of you have siblings? <clears throat> okay. One way for you to gain this sort of evolutionary immortality of getting your genes into the next generation is to be a really good aunt or uncle, right? You protect and preserve that little niece or nephew of yours, and they're carrying a bundle of your genes too. So it's not that, that, that you know, having and, and, and raising children is the only evolutionary route to, uh, uh, to the future, but it, it, it is a good one, and... Um, and, and the love business would seem to be related to that. But it's not necessary. Um, if you think about it, well, all right, spiders. Let's think of spiders. Um, spiders, the, the, the reproduction thing works fine with spiders. Um, it's, not clear, it's, it's not clear how much love and romance there is involved here. It's not clear for a couple of reasons. One of them is it's very unclear what's going on in the mind of an animal in general. You just don't have any access. In fact, or at least you have only the barest of sort of inferential access. In fact, I don't have any access to what's going on inside your mind. It is an assumption on my part that you guys have mental lives like mine. You could be what the philosophers, what is, in, in philosopher jargon, you could all be zombies, which in, if you're doing philosophy means you're things that look human, behave like they're human, but aren't human because there's nothing happening in there. It, there's no... You know, you could be cunningly designed machines. I don't know that, but it's a useful assumption uh, that, that your mental life and my mental life is similar. It is not a terribly useful assumption that uh, my mental life and a spider's mental life are similar. Um, and in any case, if you look at spider um, behavior, it doesn't look much like romantic love. I mean, the guy spends most of his time trying to avoid being killed by the, by the female spider, who is typically much bigger he does a variety of courtship sorts. We'll talk about this later in the term, but I cannot resist. Um, there are variety of spider species where, they d where the spider does engage in a lot of courtship behavior. The male spider, he brings her presence, um, like he brings her a dead fly. The reason he brings her a dead fly is if she's busy chowing down on the dead fly, she doesn't bite his little head off. Um, and it, it's, all, it's not desperately romantic. Um, but in any case, it does work perfectly well for reproduction. It suggests that there might be, even when you're talking about love between uh, potential mates, that there might be a distinction to be made between love and, and uh, well, lust or some sort of sex drive or something like that. Um, there is evidence um, at a neurochemical level that these are distinct. Um, the chemical pathways in the brain that are involved in romantic love seem to be those that are also involved in parent-child bonds uh, of attachment. They uh, involve um, chemicals like, well, they're, they're, uh, your brain generates opioid chemicals, um, which are like opium, which is why opium is, is, is a powerful uh, drug when taken externally, uh, taken from the, from the outside. But in any case, the... Um, Bonds of love involve those, the, uh, those chemicals. Um, the bonds of lust um, involve things like testosterone and other androgens and estrogens um, that they may have talked about at endless length in high school uh, biology or something of that sort. But there's evidence that these are separate. How did they come to, together? Well, evolutionary psychologists suggest that the link might be that if you bring... Um, uh, if you bring love to bear, this romantic bonding, this attachment to bear, then you've got pairs of, um, of people who stick around, stick to each other in ways that are good for um, the begetting and raising of children. And that maybe um, this uh, bonding between parent and child got co-opted into being romantic love. Um, between potential mates. Another way of putting it would be to say, well, maybe romantic love exists because um, straight out, you know, the, the just regular old lust 
is not compatible with civilization. If people are just simply acting on their uh, you know, evolutionarily based desire to mate, it's hard to run a civilization. It's hard to run a university, for instance, because people are busy. <laughs> so what you've got to do, what you've got to do is if you're going to run a civilization, you have to find some way to channel that sex drive into other activities so that the rest of civilization can, can keep going. Now, if you start talking in those terms, you're talking in terms that you will see are very much like what Freud said. Freud argued that, um, uh, that things like romantic love are necessary in order to have a civilization in the absence that, that, that uh, you know, if you're a spider, you don't need, um, you don't need romantic love, um, but you're also not going to have, well, spider civilization is, is, is somewhat um, somewhat more limited. Now, um, how does Lara know that Mark loves her? Well, he said so, right? Well, that's cool. I can say so too, right? I love you. Um, I might, I might even sort of kind of mean it in this sort of generic, I love all of humanity kind of sense, but it's obviously different. Now, uh, there, there are various other ways that he can be indicating the fact that he is in love with her. Um, but she's got to figure this out. Is he really in love with me or is he just kind of act? Actually, he's got to figure it out, too. Am I really in love with her? Her act of perception, it's, it's, it would be perfectly possible for her to be wrong, right? She looks at him. She thinks, he's in love with me. And he's thinking, I'm not in love with her. I'm just faking. You know. <laughs> right? Could be. Now, could it go the other way? Could he be thinking, I'm in love with her, and it not be true? I'm, is, is, that logically, is that logically possible? Now, and who could tell you that it wasn't true? Your mother? You don't really love her. <laughs> Well, you know, you probably wouldn't buy that anymore, but you would have once. Um, if you plot, uh, let's see, how are we going to do this? All right, well, this is age. I know this axis is age. Um, so if you plot the percentage of people who say, you, a you ask kids, who knows your inner emotions the best? Um, you. Or, you can give it an open-ended question, but the real categories are you or mom and dad. Um, it turns out, so if this is you and this is mom and dad, um, that function crosses the 50% point at the surprisingly late age of early adolescence. Before that, um, the majority of kids are will assert that mom and dad know their um, emotions better than they themselves know it. How could that be the case? Well, it, it's, not, it, it, it's hard to get yourself back into that mental state um, at this point. It gets easier again once you have kids of your own because you're looking at your kid um, and, and you know, you're like your, your four-year-old kid and your kid's doing it. You know, and you say, got to go to the bathroom? No, nah, I've got to go to the bathroom. You've got to go to the bathroom. No, nah, I don't have to go to the bathroom. You sure you don't have to go to the bathroom? No, no, okay, I guess you don't have to go to the bathroom. Let's all get in the car. I've got to go to the bathroom. Um, and so if the kid is a little self-reflective, he thinks, hey, wait a minute. First of all, not only do I have to go to the bathroom, but, you know, mom and dad, they, like, knew that before I did. That's cool. <laughs> That's also a little scary because... I thought a whole bunch of other things. I wonder if they know those things too. <laughs> Eventually, you figure out, no, I didn't know that stuff, which is just as well for all concerned. Um, but um, the, returning to the love example, the point is that you need to know, you, you need to perform an act of perception to decide that somebody else loves you, and you need to do, do an act of sort of self-perception to decide that you love somebody else. Um, you might also ask yourself at that point, well, what is it that you love? Physical attributes? That's considered sort of crass. And you know, even worse would be to say, I love her for her money and possessions. All right? That sounds terrible. But if you ask yourself, what are you watching on TV? 
there's a continuous pairing of love, sex, and cars, soda, anything, right? Right? Well, you know, I can't think of any particular ads at the moment because I don't watch enough TV. I'll ask my kids if there are any good sex and soda ads on at the moment, but there certainly have been. Um, in any case, Typically, we say things like, you know, I love her for her mind or something like that. Now, you could, can you, you could love your laptop for its mind, too. Um, it doesn't seem to be quite the, uh, the, the, the same thing. Um, now, all right, so the, the question of what it is that you might love, where is that love if, um, in you? Does that question make any sort of sense? Well, there's a traditional answer to that. If you asked um, where love lives, the sort of conventional out there um, in several hundred years ago probably would be simpler kind of answer would be heart. Well, yeah, liver's good too, but that, that's only if you're, the, the cool white virgin snows upon my heart have abated the ardor of my liver, says the prince guy in, 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 in Shakespeare's um, Tempest. Um, there's this notion, that, that, that very much a folk psychological notion, that emotions are resident in the viscera. Um, and that makes a degree of sense, because um, when you see the object of your heart's desire, you know it's your heart's desire because your heart goes thump, 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 right? Now, you think that if love is localized, um, you know, if, if there is some chunk of, of you that is, it is your love for whoever this significant other might be. Where is that likely to be? Brain, somebody muttered up there. Yeah, it's probably in your brain. Um, you can imagine why that was a hard notion to come by because, you know, you look at the object of your desire and you don't suddenly say, ah, my head! Um, <laughs> and you probably won't be say, sending brain-shaped chocolates to anybody at Valentine's Day either. Um, but it is, a, it is an interesting question to ask whether or not, all right, brain maybe, is it localized enough that there's some little piece of brain that we could go to and say, you know, Mark's love for Lara is there. And if we went in and pulled that board out, out, of, out, of, his, uh, out of his computer, that, you know, he'd know who Lara was and he'd know everything else, but he just wouldn't be in love anymore. Is that, localiz is that level of localization... Um, plausible. Um, is the love normal? Is his love... Is, 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 is Mark loves Lara for her mind. Um, is that normal? Suppose he loved her for her foot. <laughs> would that be normal? What's the difference? Why would one be... And if it wasn't normal, who gets to decide that it's normal? Do we, as a community, get to decide? Does, does the family get to decide? Is there some objective way to decide whether something is or is not normal? And if it's not normal, what do we get to do about it? Do we get to, um, uh, you know, if it's not, if, if, if it's not normal and uh, uh, would drugs fix it? Um, would surgery fix it? Would some sort of therapy fix it? Um, look, well, you look, you can see what's going on here. From a simple uh, sort of statement like, you know, Mark loves Laura, we can get to essentially any of the sort of topics that will show up in a course like this. Any you could have done, we, we, we wouldn't have had to use love as the particular example. Behind any of these things that we um, use perfectly comfortably in everyday life is a large set of very interesting questions, only a very few of which, of course, I can manage to address in an introductory level course. But the goal here would be to give you some sort of um, overview of the sorts of topics and the sorts of answers that um, modern academic psychology has, uh, has come up with. Um, the way that we do that is through lectures, um, through recitations, which are uh, not, should not be treated as optional. We expect you to be there. They're not just like reviews for the exam or you know, there aren't problem sets in an introductory psych class the way they would be in chemistry or something. Um, you're expected to be there. They're, they're an integral 
um, part of the course, and there's the textbook. It's a good idea to, to look at it. Um, I won't go into a lot more detail about the mechanics of the course. The syllabus will tell you um, most of what you want to know, and it's a really good idea to actually take a look at the syllabus and to take a look at the writing assignments um, because you know they have due dates attached to them and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, I will answer any uh, blazingly mechanical questions about the course if, if they have occurred to anybody at the moment. Otherwise, I will plunge into the brain in a moment. Um, after satisfying my thirst motivation yet more. The, um, okay, let me say that the sort of ideological grounding of this course is that the course, like uh, academic psychology generally, is materialist in its, in its ideology. What does that mean? What that means is that um, the mind is what the brain does, and uh, that if you have thoughts, if you have feelings, uh, if you have memories, that they, these things arise out of the brain. This is not to say they are necessarily, that, they, that if, if we wanted to teach a straight neuroscience course, we just teach you about the brain. Um, but it is to say that um, it is in distinction to another old philosophical position, which is dualism, which says that the mind is somehow an immaterial something that is separate from the brain. It interacts with you, it interacts with your, uh, with your, with your body, but is, is, is separate. Um, the reason for talking about the brain for this lecture and a chunk of the next lecture is this notion that, um, that the mind is what the, uh, um, what the brain does. And, um, well... If we want to find out what the brain does, let's see, we could make a little bit of a list here. You go up. Oh, we've got to get rid of a little more of whatever that was. Um, so, I, I, do I have a copy of the handout here somewhere? Yes, okay, so I can ask because it just has four broad classes of methods on the handout without describing them. Um, how might we go about finding out what the, uh, what the brain does? Oh, this reminds me to say, anytime during the course of the term, if you've got a question, comment, or whatever, feel free to raise your hand, and, and um, I will attempt to um, answer it if I think we're being hopelessly uh, you know, diverted from where I think we need to get in the lecture. I may have to cut off discussion, but I, I'm more than happy to have the opportunity. Um, so don't just because it's a great big lecture, don't feel that you just got to sit there and not, um, not do anything interactive like raise your hand. Um, of course, if you raise your hand, you might end up exposing the details of your romantic engagements with the person sitting next to you, but that's a risk you'll have to take. Um, anyway, if, uh, if you wanted to find out how the, mind, how the brain worked, what the brain did, how, can you go, how, how could we go about doing that? Anybody got, yes. You could cut the brain open and look at it. Okay, that, that, that's, uh, that's option zero on my list of one to four. Um, no, it, it's not, it, not, not because it's, um, uh, it, it's trivial in any sense, but I, I'm, I'm looking for techniques that get more at the function than at the structure. But there is a certain amount that you do learn from just looking at the structure. In fact, Descartes, one of the founders of the dualist view, looked at the anatomy of the brain, thought, you know, if the immaterial mind and soul are interacting with the brain, well, the brain is a doubled structure, right? It's got these two sort of symmetrical hemispheres. The, that interaction between um, the immaterial soul and the body must be at one point. He looked at the anatomy, saw the pineal gland, which is a piece of brain lying on the midline, and thought, because there's only one of those, that must be the point. So you can, you can make inferences from structure alone. That particular inference is wrong, but, um, but you could do it. Yes, the person in front there. Yes, you. You're at... um, okay, MRI. We will make that into the larger category of, of imaging techniques. Um, for, for psych purposes, the most uh, dramatic version of this is so-called fMRI, for functional magnetic resonance 
imaging. This is the new entry on the list, really. Um, remarkable breakthrough in the time that I've been teaching this course is the ability to now look at the structure and um, some aspects of the function of the brain in intact, um, you know, alive, awake human beings. You simply couldn't do that anymore, and that's a remarkable, well, it's a remarkable boon for psychology and, and a huge advance for um, medicine. So, for instance, um, if you had a brain tumor, there are symptoms of having a brain tumor, but the only way to find out if you actually had a tumor, because you'd want to take this tumor out if you could, the only way to find out um, yeah, a generation ago was to, uh, to do exploratory surgery and, 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 and open up the brain and see where the thing was. Now you'd be in an MR scanner you know, by the end of the day and, and, and we'd know. Um, so, yes, very useful technique. Um, you're going to offer me another one? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll put this under the category of lesions, brain damage. Um, if this is the newest, that, this is probably the oldest of the, of the um, basic techniques. If you damage brains um, in the same way, uh, you end up getting symptoms that are similar across people and even across species in, um, in many cases. And that is a tip-off that, um, first of all, that the brain has something to do with mental life and that specific bits of brain have specific things to do with specific aspects of mental life. The real um, uh, advances in this sort of research um, and this sort of understanding of the brain came, oh, I guess mid to late 19th century when, um, with advances both in medicine and in, uh, I suppose, what you could call military technology. In earlier times, if you got a penetrating wound to the brain, odds were that you were simply going to be dead. Um, but by the mid to late 19th century, people were surviving with penetrating brain injuries. And it became clear, and, and um, uh, uh, bullets were, um, could be leaving comparatively small lesions. And so it became increasingly clear that different bits of brain damage did. Um, different things. Um, let me find myself a place to draw another picture here. I need, I need a brain. So, here we go. One quick, whoosh, this is your brain. Um, just to orient things here. Okay, so, whoop, front, back, bottom, top. Um, if I'm facing that way, this would be looking at the outside surface of the left hemisphere. There, there, right, you've got two cerebral hemispheres about this size stuck inside your head. Um, this is, a, uh, the, the brain's got lots of wrinkles. There are a couple of large ones that I'm drawing here for my purposes because the, the cerebral hemispheres are, are conventionally divided up into four lobes. Um, the terms for which are written on the handout, so I can just give you the initials rather than writing out the whole thing. Conveniently, the frontal lobe is at the front. After that, you just simply have to learn them. Temporal lobe down at the bottom, occipital lobe at the back, and the parietal lobe on the other side of this big central sulcus that divides the frontal from the parietal um, lobe. What was found, I think originally in the Franco-Prussian War, if memory serves, 1870s, was that if you got, whoops, um, lesions to the back of the, the, the brain here, to the cortex, so the wrinkled outside surface is known as cortex. That's from the Latin word for cork, which is what anatomists thought it looked like. Um, if you get lesions back here, um, you get problems with your vision, very specifically. And if you get, um, if you got a great big lesion that took out the entire uh, occipital cortex on both sides, you'd, you'd be functionally blind. But if you got a small lesion, let's say in the left hemisphere, you would have a small region of blindness, and it would always be on the right side of the visual world. Um, and that's relative to where you're actually looking, look, uh, fixating at the moment. So if I 
fixate on this guy there who I'm now staring at, um, then if I had a lesion in my left hemisphere, some region out here, I would be blind. If the lesion was in my right hemisphere, the blind region would be on the, on the opposite side, on the, um, on the left. Um, that's the sort of thing that you could discover from lesion studies. And um, so lesions happen when you get brain injury from, uh, say, a bullet. Lesions happen from strokes. Um, one of the great advances, one of the great advantages to imaging technologies is that in the 1870s, or even until quite recently, the only way you knew about where the lesion exactly was was if the patient died and came to autopsy. You could look at the brain and look what was damaged. Now you can look at that brain in an intact individual and see where the, um, see where the, damage, um, where the damage might be. Um, so damage to the brain can tell you something about it. It's got the drawback that you're, you're trying to infer normal function from an abnormal brain at that point. Um, and that's uh, not, perfectly, not, not perfectly straightforward. Um, but it does provide, and is, is perhaps the oldest technique for providing lots of information. Yes, are you about to give me another method? Uh, behavior? Um, okay, behavior is, is, is item. Well, if that's zero, then uh, behavior is going to be uh, five. Um, and we'll spend an awful lot of the course talking about behavioral measures. But in behavior... You know, without going in and, and doing something with the tissue of the brain, you're essentially treating the brain as a black box at that point. Um, you, it, it may tell you something about the brain in, in connection with the rest of this, but we're looking for techniques that are specifically about studying brain itself. Yes? Wake surgery. Wake surgery. Oh, this is this sounds cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. I'm we're, 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 What did you have in? What's the what's the surgery part? I can I I, I can fill it. I'm, I'm I'm just trying to see if I'm if there's a six here that I'm just not thinking of that that would be cool. Otherwise, I can sort of. Oh, yeah, actually, that's one I didn't put in typically, which is that you can go in and, and start infusing stuff uh, into uh, ch chemicals into the brain and, and, and changing um, behavior. I, um, do I want to say anything more about that at the moment? I'll come. Ah, good. I'll use that one. Thank you. We'll call this stimulation in general. Uh, stimulation. You can go in and stimulate brain. So the, I was going I was, I was to do that. Um, and segue from, from the chemical stimulation to electrical stimulation, but you got there for me. Um, you can go in and stimulate the brain electrically in rats, but you can also do this in humans. Um, you, uh, in fact, uh, back, so back in the 1950s, um, Wilder Penfield, psychologist, was working with um, some neurosurgeons up in Montreal, and what they were doing was... Um, uh, they, they were doing neurosurgery on um, patients with intractable epilepsy. Epilepsy is a, a, an electrical storm in the brain, basically, um, and, um, and often is started by a piece of abnormal or damaged tissue that acts as a generator. And then what happens is a sort of an abnormal electrical activity spreads from that point of generation across the, uh, across the brain or across some chunk of the brain and causes a seizure or lapse of awareness, the sort of symptoms that you get in epilepsy. Often this is controllable by drugs, but in some cases it's not. And one of the treatments of, uh, that can be tried is to go in and try to lesion this little chunk of brain. If you take out the generator, you can often reduce the, um, the severity or eliminate the, uh, uh, eliminate the seizures. Um, but if you're going to take brain tissue out, you've got to be really careful. Um, because, well, actually, where I put this is a, is, is, a, is a pretty good example. We knew from lesion studies 
going back again into the 19th century, that areas around here um, were, that go by names like Broca and Wernicke's area, which are um, the names of 19th century neurologists, actually, vitally important in the production and understanding of language. If you are right-handed, those areas um, exist in the left hemisphere of the brain. So this is the left hemisphere of the brain. That'll work, work fine. And if they're damaged by stroke, you will have trouble with understanding language or, um, or producing language or both. Depends on the exact nature of the stroke. Um, but very, da very bad lesions to have. So if you were to discover that the, um, the epileptogenic focus the piece of bad tissue was sitting in there, um, you would say, look, I'm sorry, the, you know, we don't want to do this surgery because while I could perhaps reduce the frequency of your seizures, um, it's going to mean that you're, you've got real problems with language and that trade-off is not worth it. On the other hand, if, if, if the generator was here, um, say, look, I, I can reduce the, the frequency of your seizures and you'll have a, a, a relatively small area of blindness out in the uh, right visual field somewhere, say, look, I'm not thrilled about being blind in some part of my visual field, but that trade-off is worth it. So you need to know where you are in the brain in order to do this sort of surgery. And what Penfield did was to stimulate the brain of awake individuals in effect to ask, you know, what's this bit of brain doing? Now, how can you do that? Doesn't that kind of hurt a lot? Um, the answer is that um, they're under local anesthetic to get through the skull and the outer surface, the, 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 the membranes across the surface of the, uh, of, of the, um, of the brain, uh, because in case you hadn't noticed, you know, digging holes with a sharp stick in your skull really hurts. Um, but once you get to brain, there are no pain receptors in the brain itself. There's nothing, um, once, once you've got the brain exposed, you can do anything you want to the brain and, 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 and the brain won't particularly complain. Um, I don't suggest you try this, but, um, but you could. Um, now, why, well, let, let's step back. Why have pain receptors at all? What, what's pain good for? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you know, pain, pain, pain's there to keep you from hurting yourself. You know, if you don't have pain and your hand's on the hot stove, you say, oh, I'm cooking my hand. That's, you know, big deal. In fact, people who are, there are rare cases of people who are congenitally insensitive to pain, and it's, it's bad news. They end up injuring themselves. Um, that being the case, why not have pain receptors in your brain? Yeah? Yeah. By the time, you know, if you th sort of think in sort of evolutionary terms, by the time the bear is chewing on your brain, you know, <laughs> you might as well just kind of go with the experience because it's not going not to matter much. Um, so the advantage here is that you can go in and stimulate um, brain tissue and, and it, it's not a vast, it's, it's, it's a somewhat, from the sound of it, somewhat uncanny experience, but it's not an unpleasant experience. And so, all right, so what Penfield did, you know, stick a little electrode, say, here, and, and put a little electrical current there, and what the patient would report, if it was here, this is to the parietal side of this big central sulcus, what the, what the, what the patient would uh, report is, I, I feel it, it feels like you're touching my foot. Okay, move the electrode a little bit. Oh, now it feels like you're sort of touching me in my, the middle of my back. Um, you know, now it feels like you're touching my hand. No, 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 it's the end of my nose. And what, what Penfield found was that the surface of the body was laid out across the surface of the brain. In, in the left hemisphere, it would actually be the surface of the right side of the body. Whoosh. I don't know what that is. Um, and, and, and it is feet up, head down, as I recall. Um, but that chunk of brain, which is called somatosensory cortex, the term's on the handout somewhere, um, represents the, uh, the, 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 the sensations coming from the skin. Now, I, I haven't drawn a terribly realistic picture here, but the actual map is hugely distorted. 
Yes, it's something. Okay. I'll, I'll do that. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, anyway, okay, so this, this, this map, known as the homunculus for the little man in the head, um, the sensory homunculus specifically, is, is massively distorted. Um, some chunks of your skin are heavily overrepresented in the brain, some are heavily underrepresented. So what's overrepresented? Hands and face and on the face, lips, lips and tongue and things like that. So um, uh, somewhere in Gleitman, I'm, I'm like in the chapter you'll read tonight with luck, um, there's a, a picture, people love making little models of the homunculus. Right, so to project it back out into the world, and, and, and what would it look like if this was a one-for-one a -one mapping, and you get this guy with, you know, huge lips and huge hands and a little tiny back. Um, and the way to get a feeling for this is to ask yourself, if you were trying to figure out uh, what something felt like, how would you go about doing that? Well, you would go and explore it with your hands. A little kid... Um, less restrained than you would also probably put it in its mouth and, 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 and feel it that way. What, what, what you wouldn't do is, you know, rub it against your back or something like, uh, like that because it's the hands and the lips and stuff that have the very dense um, sensory uh, skin receptors and, and it's sparser in your, on your back. Now, you will also, you, you can test the, the prudery of your introductory psych text by checking out um, whether the uh, homunculus is anatomically correct, um, the, the genitalia are well represented in the sensory homunculus also. My recollection is that they are well represented in Gleitman. There are texts where it's kind of... Oh, I've actually, there's one great version where, he, uh, where, where the uh, homunculus is wearing a, like a little uh, a, a, a towel. Um, <laughs> I've seen that once. That was cute. Okay, so... Stimulate here, and the, the, the person feels like um, you're touching them on their skin. Uh, if, if you go around to the, uh, to the right hemisphere, they'd feel the stimulation down the left side of the body. Go to the other side of this, uh, into the frontal lobe, and instead of saying, oh, I feel like you're, you're, you're touching my, my leg, um, uh, the leg would twitch. It's right, yes, left hemisphere, right leg, or you move a little further, the arm would twitch, or just one muscle in the arm, or something like that. Here you've got a motor homunculus laid out across the, uh, the br across motor cortex, and this chunk of the brain is important in, in the generation of voluntary um, movements. Again, it's a distorted map. Hands very overrepresented. If you're a monkey, feet are very overrepresented. But you, who cannot hang upside down from a tree by your feet or your tail or whatever, and your feet are comparatively um, impoverished in their represent, uh, representation. Tongue and, and, and vocal apparatus, heavily overrepresented. Um, so same sort of story, sensory and, um, and motor. Now, these days, you don't even need to um, uh, go and cut open the skull to do this sort of thing. Um, transcrani transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS for short, involves generating a large magnetic field close to the skull. Um, as your physics background will tell you, that generates an electrical field. If you shape the magnetic field right, you can generate an electrical field underneath, in the brain tissue and basically produce the same sort of brain stimulation that, you would, that Penfield was producing in an open skull um, with the same results. Nancy Canwisher, who's a, a professor in the uh, department here, um, uh, used to be up at Harvard, uh, got on the front of the Harvard um, Gazette for teaching her intro class with a, uh, a TMS stimulator in hand and said, you know, want to see where my motor cortex is? <laughs> um, I, she, I, no, I'm not going to do that. Sorry. The reason I'm not going to do that, by the way, is I'm a chicken. It's... TMS is undoubtedly, almost undoubtedly safe. Um, you know, lots of people do it. Um, but it sounds too much like things that I learned about when I was taking intro psych that were used to generate epileptic fo foci in, you know, like rats. You know, let's stimulate, boop, 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 and now the rat's got epilepsy. You know, I don't, and it doesn't seem to happen in TMS, but I'm a chicken um, when it comes to my brain. Yes. 
Um, could I, um, yeah, that, that is, it's, um, well, we'll find out if I can spell homunculus. Uh, Paul, is it a U or an O? Home monk, ho, U, home monk, yes, it must be. Home monk, U, plus. One of the reasons for handouts, by the way, um, is so that when people ask me, can I please spell it, it's on the handout somewhere because the answer is no, I can't. Um, so the homunculus pro derived from the Latin for a little man in the head. Um, but I, and, I, and I apologize to the women. I was trying to figure out today what, 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 what the little woman in the head would be, but my Latin has waned since I took it in college. Maybe it's the femunculus, I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, that's, that, that's, the, um, that's the homunculus. Um, the, so, so, and then the stimulation, that, that's, that's stimulation techniques. Um, I still, I'm, I'm shopping for one more useful technique here. Anybody care to offer me another, uh, another technique for figuring out what's going on in the brain? Well, the case studies are typically these lesion studies, right? Somebody has something wrong with them, and we try to figure out what's wrong with them. That goes way back, by the way. Um, the early efforts to figure out what brain, bits of brain did um, come from the uh, phrenologists, early 19th century, phrenology. Um, if you know anything about phrenology, you learned it from the Cartoon Network, right? Because you watched Bugs Bunny beat Elmer Fudd over the head, right? And then the bumps showed up and you felt the bumps. Uh, looking at me like, what's he talking about? Right, or or you know it because there, there's a, a wide oh, a, any of these um, umpteen cartoons, um, uh, you know, uh, or or sculptures where you have a, a head that's got little functions all over it, right? You know, this is yeah yeah okay good somebody's I'm not just making up weird stuff. Um, they the the phrenologists believed that the shape of the skull reflected the underlying shape of the um, uh, of the brain that bigger meant more of that particular function, which is rather like this. I mean, it's not a completely wacko assumption. Um, and, um, and they then used a sort of a case study system to try to figure out what different parts of the brain did. So um, if you wanted to know where criminality was in the brain, you'd go and find yourself some criminals and check where they got big chunks of their brain. And that's where those sort of maps came from. It, it's, a, it's a rather ad hoc sounding kind of process um, now, uh, so amativeness, lust, is typically located back here. The reason it's located back here is because Spurzheim, one of the founders of phrenology, had in his um, uh, care a, how did he describe it? I think he's, she's described as a passionate widow. And every time he, put, he Spurzheim, put her, his hand on the back of her neck, it became red and inflamed, and he therefore concluded that that's where lust lived. It turns out, though, that if you read old phrenology texts, the original phrenology texts, they read not unlike introductory psych texts or introductory you know, brain science texts with a few unfortunate assumptions, like the notion that skull shape reflects underlying brain shape, which it does not very well. Um, there was, yes, pink person. Um, okay, well that's, so, um, we'll put the, looking at the cells part on, under the anatomy, my wife would hate this. My wife is a neuroanatomist, that's what she does for a living. She would want many categories for that, um, all by itself. But yes, you, so you can go look at, um, certainly as, um, well you can use this in a, in a number of contexts. If you're going to go stimulate, th th these days, if you're going to go stimulate brain cells, you might be doing it on a slice of brain in a dish um, to see how it's connected to the next one, and you would be looking at the individual cells under a microscope while you were doing that. Yes? Oh, yeah, that's a genetics is another candi candidate for five, but, uh, um, but I will actually, if you take a look at, um, uh, that, that allows me to make a somewhat different point. On the handouts, the writing assignments that you get in this course this year will um, uh, have as their starting point 
readings that live on the, uh, on the Stellar website for the course. Oh, they particularly will if I ever give Mara the disk to put them up there. Um, I'll have to remember that. Um, the one that's on for this lecture, this, uh, if, if one wanted to write based starting from this lecture, uh, it is actually a genetic study. Turns out that there are two flavors of vole out there, a little rodent-like animal. Um, some voles are promiscuous. Some voles are not promiscuous. They just hang out with one, I guess lady voles, that's a basketball team, isn't it? Anyway, the, I guess they're vols, not voles. Anyway, um, the claim of a new paper this year is that um, manipulation of a single gene is, is able to turn promiscuous voles into faithful voles. So in that sense, yes, absolutely, genetics are a new tool for, for getting to this. It's not what I'm fishing for. I'll take one more bit of fishing expedition, and then I'll just... All right, that'll be, that's, that's fine, too. In, in vole land? Yes, it's the male voles who are promiscuous. Yeah, I mean, and they're manipulating the, 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 the sexual behavior of the male voles the female voles don't have the, the big asymmetry, the, the, the two species of voles don't have the big asymmetry in their behavior to start with, apparently. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's, it's a guy thing. More on that later in the term. Yes? Yeah, re, re, reading brain signals, we'll, we'll call that recording um, in some fashion or other. If you can stick an electrode into the brain and stimulate, you can also stick a electrode into the brain and uh, record from brain tissue and ask what a particular uh, cell or bunch of cells are, are doing. You can do this at a large scale level in um, you know, walking around human beings um, or animals by putting electrodes on the skull. You can read mast activities of large numbers of neurons off the surface of the skull. Um, and um, that, that, that's a so-called electroencephalogram, EEG. Um, but, uh, and, and that's very useful, for instance, in telling the difference between different wake and sleep states. If you are deeply asleep, the sort of sleep that when the alarm clock goes off, you're, oh, you know, where am I? If you look at the EEG, you find big, slow waves. All the cells are active, and then all the cells are quiet, and they're all firing together. When you're... Um, and looking at a, uh, an awake individual, the, the, the waveform is much uh, smaller amplitude and higher frequency because, you know, the, you know the, the, the calculus piece of your brain is currently napping and the psychology piece is wide awake and, 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 and various bits are doing things out of synchrony with each other. So you can see that from mass recordings. But if you now go and stick an electrode, let's, let's suppose we go and stick an electrode into... Well, this, let's take the same cell that, that, that you know, I, I stimulate here, and if the, 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 the patient said, you know, I feel that in my toe. If instead of stimulating, you record, you find out that that cell doesn't change its behavior at all over a huge range of possible things that the organism could be doing. But if you poke the toe, that cell says, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that and exactly that. You go poke the armpit or something, the cell doesn't care. You poke the other, you know, the next toe over, the cell doesn't care. You poke one particular toe, let us say, that cell will care. Take a cell out here somewhere, and um, that cell will care only if you put visual stimuli in a particular little spot in the right side of visual space, in a very particular part of visual space. Move over a little bit, and it'll want stimulation in a different piece of visual space. Move elsewhere in the brain, and now rather than liking, say, a, just something simple like a line moving around, uh, a cell down here, um, this is typically done in things like monkeys, and so that cell might be very interested if you show it the hand of a monkey. Right? Uh, ah, cell's thrilled. Show it, you know, a hunk of chalk. I don't care. Um, Na you know, nearby one might like the face of a monkey and so on. So you can find out what individual cells are interested in by recording their activity. There are some significant drawbacks to this, 
which is that you can only, one of them is that you can only sample from a tiny fraction of the cells, even in an area that you are interested in. H how many cells do you think there, how many neurons do you think there are in the brain? So the, 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 the answer is, yes, a lot is, is, is a good answer, but the answer is going to be expressed in terms of 10 to the x. What's x, would you guess? The, the, uh, well, the, the 24s are a little high and the 9s are a little low. Um, when I asked this question when I was in graduate school, um, I got the, the answer that there are... Uh, a pro nobody knows the answer for sure because, you know, how, who's going to go and count? Um, that, oops, that there are 10 to the 12th neurons in the brain. And of these, I didn't even tell you on this picture, but here, we can draw a tail on this thing. Um, hanging off the back of the brain, sort of underneath the back, is, is the cerebellum. It means little brain. Um, it, it, important in learning and motor control sorts of things. Um, we're not going to say much about it here, sadly, but what my professor said was there are, oops, 10 to the 12th neurons in the brain. Of these, 10 to the 13th are in the cerebellum. Uh, the, 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 the quick on the uptake crowd uh, picked up that there's a problem here. Right? What he was trying to tell me was not that he didn't understand um, math, but that, look, we don't even really know to an order of magnitude how many cells there are in the brain. Um, but that uh, lots on this order. How many cells can you record from in, um, uh, in, a, in a study of some function in the brain? You know, heroic single unit, single cell recording studies might have... Um, uh, you know, on the order of 10 to the second, 100 cells recorded from. Moreover, if you're going to stick an electrode in the brain, the cells that it encounters are going to be biased by things like size. You're more likely to get big cells than little cells, and big cells do things that are different than little cells um, do in the brain. So it's not... You can imagine that it would be difficult to figure out... Um, what your laptop did by recording from I, you know, single components on the motherboard. Um, that wouldn't be particularly easy. Um, it gets significantly worse when you try to uh, um, do that in, in the brain as a, uh, as a whole. Um, the, best, the things we know best about in the brain are things where we can bring all of these techniques to bear and get um, what, what would be called converging evidence, converging data on it, um, evidence from multiple different sources, and then corroborate that by looking at, at, at um, behavioral, behavioral measures. Oh, let me say, um, well, all right, this, this is the moment in the lecture where, my wife, where, where, where I, I really feel my wife looking over my shoulder. In two minutes, I will polish off the rest of the brain. Um, so that's just the surface of the brain, right? You know, the, the, uh, the, the brain is a 3D structure. One way to, to, to very grossly think about the, the, the overall structure of the brain is that um, if there's cortex that lying underneath cortex is what uh, are a bunch of structures that often get called limbic structures. This is really an outdated term. It comes from the word for ring, and it was the notion that there was a circuit of structures lying under the brain, uh, un, under the cortex, but there's a, a, a collection of structures who's, who will show up later in the term um, with names like the amygdala from the Latin for um, almond, uh, hippocampus, is it Latin for almond or Greek for almond? I'm not sure at the moment. Um, hippocampus from the word for seahorse. Not because you have almonds or seahorses in your brain, but because the, the shapes of these things are faintly reminiscent of such things out in the real world. Um, and other structures that turn out to be vitally important in, emotional, um, in, in your emotional life and in, um, in memory. Hippocampus will show up later as, as, as critical in memory. Lying underneath there um, and heading on down into spinal cord, oh, I don't know, let's call it the core today or something, um, are a set of structures um, that, uh, well, we tend to spend a lot of time in psychology talking about the cool stuff happening up in the cortex and stuff like that. But the stuff you really don't want to lose, the stuff we don't know about from lesion studies, is down here. 
Because something in your brain has to say to your heart, beat, beat, beat. That piece of brain goes, you got really big trouble. There's another piece down there that says, time to breathe. Time to breathe again. I mean, it's not glamorous work, but, you know, somebody... So there's a whole set of stuff here running vegetative processes, and also important, not, not just for, you know, pacemaker kinds of things, but also for general uh, issues of arousal um, and, and um, sleep and wakefulness, those sort of things. Uh, so that is an embarrassingly brief tour of, 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 of the... You can spend your life on neuroanatomy. Trust me, my wife does. Um, we'll come back and talk about single cells on Tuesday. <laughs>